Let's open up in prayer, because uh, after the class, um, the, the kids are going to do their last Purim run through um, for the Purim play on Saturday. So I'm super excited about that. Uh, let, but let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Lord, we just uh, thank you for this day. We thank you and praise you with everything I have in me for the warmer weather today. Um, thank you for uh, just the opportunity to come together to study your word, to have fellowship time. Lord, we lift up those who are still uh, struggling with sickness. We lift up the Averys tonight as they're hosting uh, the first of many, many Passover seders around Oklahoma City. Uh, we lift up um, the Holloman family, uh, Josiah specifically, as, as he's on week like four of his cough. Um, also, my children, who are on week like 22 of the cough. Uh, and so we just ask with all the allergies and the things that are in bloom and the random viruses that are going around, Lord, that you would just strengthen the immune system of all, um, especially the elderly, those who, uh, who are young as well, who, who um, are more susceptible to the illness. And so we just bless you. We thank you uh, for this time. Lord, we, uh, we pray for any of those who will be watching this on the broadcast uh, later on, uh, any ailments that they might be going through or, or problems they might be experiencing. Lord, uh, we're not just a family in-house, face-to-face, but also wherever you, uh, you put family together. And so we thank you for that. We bless you in the name of Yeshua. Amen and amen. Hi, Eitan. Hi, buddy. Hey, before you run out of here tonight, I, uh, I need to hear about your, uh, your, your first ever t-ball practice. Do you think you could tell me about that? All right, I'm super excited. Super excited. I was a little distracted by the text message thread last night, taking care of some business, but I am very excited to hear that. Okay, so um, I honestly have lost count of how many classes we've done. we've done. I think this is the eighth class that we have done. We've done Who is Jesus? We've talked about the biblical canon. Um, we've talked about the Trinity. We've talked about the Holy Spirit. We've talked about a lot of different things. Um, I specifically kept God the Father to be the latter because most of the people who watch this and most of the people who are in our church, they come from some element of the roots base of Christianity. And in that, there's a lot of emphasis talking about Adonai, Yahweh, Yahweh, uh, Yahweh um, Yahuwah. There's all kinds of names and pronunciations. Uh, we'll go through some of them tonight. Um, but I do think it's important uh, that, that we not just skip over the role of God the Father, uh, that we go back and we try to take a healthy look at God the Father. And so last week we talked about the Trinity. Um, and in previous classes, we started off with Jesus. Uh, this church is rooted on Jesus first and foremost. And then we went into the Holy Spirit. Um, I made it pretty abundantly clear while going through the scripture that I believe in the concept of the Trinity. I laid out why that's there. Um, we looked at modalism. We looked at some of the other concepts of different thought processes. Um, and so I would encourage you if, you, if you missed out on any of those, they're all on YouTube. There's a little podcast. There's even a transcript on the website. Uh, in fact, on the website under the resources link uh, has the transcript, has the podcast, and the YouTube link. So if you're like, oh, I, I don't remember where it was, like that page on the website has links to all of those. Uh, go back and look at that. Some of those are super deep scriptures. You know, there's like eight to 10 scriptures per every point. I'm trying to give you guys the resources to also be able to really go study that out um, for yourself. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to go read it. I want you to come to the understanding you have uh, by the inspiration of God and the Holy Spirit, not just because some pastor, including a pastor like myself, just says it. So I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, take a deep dive into the roles, natures, and functions of Yeshua and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but today we're going to look at God the Father. We're going to look at two different aspects. One, um, one of them is God as the Father in the hierarchy of the Bible. Uh, I want you to think kind of like positional authority, um, almost, almost job-related, where you think of there's a manager, there's assistant managers, there's sometimes team leads. You know, sometimes there's that, that positional authority hierarchy. A lot of times we, we think of positional authority as all authority. It's simply not, but it is one that, that we do interact with on a regular basis. Um, also, the function, the functions of the roles. Um, we did the very same thing with Yeshua. We did the very same thing with the Holy Spirit, the functions of how they operate, and then the nature of, of God the Father as well. Um, 
we saw with Yeshua specifically that there's a dual nature. There is a divine nature and a human nature. Um, obviously, throughout the scriptures, it doesn't say that Yahweh has taken on flesh himself in that role. Yeshua would be Yahweh in the flesh. And so um, we're not going to be looking at the, the human natures of, of Yahweh today. Uh, but two aspects that, that need to be delineated, uh, what they are in the, in the body of this lesson and, and how do we shift from one to the other is going to be that fatherhood, God the Father, should set the stage for two things. One is the passing on of life, and two is the passing on of an inheritance. The passing on of life and the passing on of inheritance. These are two distinct roles of, of fathers. Now, the, the Hebrew term Elohim should not be really an unusual term for you in the room. Um, it is one that's been used over and over and over again. Brent used it in the Gospel of the Hebrews series. This is a word that is grammatically plural for gods or deities. It's, it's plural in nature, Elohim, gods, deities. And though Elohim is plural in its form, it is traditionally used throughout the Torah in a singular nature. Like, God, God has this unique way of saying, like, there's more than one layer to the onion. Uh, there's more than one layer to the double-decker burger. Like, it's plural grammatically, but yet it's used singularly almost entirely throughout the Torah. And so we see this in Genesis 1.1. That's kind of been our, our, our verse for building blocks recently. In the beginning, God, the word for God there is Elohim, created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and the darkness over the face of the deep and the spirit, the Ruach talked about that in the Holy spirit class of Elohim was hovering over the face of the waters. Elohim traditionally in the Torah is referencing the one true God of Israel. Um, also known as Yahweh predominantly in most Christian circles. It's, it's known as Yahweh. If they're talking about the name, it would be Yahweh uh, for for Messianics, Hebrew roots, um, whatever you want to call yourself, Messianic Judaism, a lot of times it's Adonai. Uh, Judaism as a whole, it would be considered Hashem. Uh, and even though Hashem is not a name, it would be a title. Uh, and so you will also see the Hebrew article uh, accompanying Elohim to specify. So in Hebrew, a lot of times it's not just Elohim. If they're writing Elohim, they will use a Hebrew article or articles to specify even further. That, so they're not just referencing God. They're not just referencing God. Like this is a big thing in Judaism and in the Hebrew culture is that they don't want anybody, if they're talking about the one true God of Israel, they don't want anybody to think that they're talking about any other delineated God of any other culture or demigod or whatever. And so a lot of times you will see them say Elohim Hayim. And I'm not, I don't have that... <sighs> And if I did that more, um, you guys would get to see why we cough over the last four months. So, but that, that haim, uh, which actually means the living God. So a lot of times there's those Hebrew articles that are placed in conjunction to Elohim when Hebrews are writing or talking, because they absolutely want to make sure you understand that they're not talking about gods or, or deities in general. They're talking about the one true God of the Hebrews, the God of the Israelites. This is, uh, this is also why you'll see uh, in order for them to not profane God's name, which is obviously a commandment to not, to not profane the name of the Lord, you'll see that uh, Jewish sages actually encourage people to pronounce Elohim as Elohim, C-H-E-E-M. And I, I know it sounds like it's almost the same, depending upon the accent, if you're a Brooklyn Jew or whatever, like Hasidic or you're Reformed. Sometimes it, it would be very subtle, but it's subtle enough to them that they encourage the, uh, them to do Elohim and Haim into one word so that you're not profaning the name of God. That's how serious they take the reverence to, to the name of God. You know, uh, I say that because culturally, um, you, especially nowadays, when I was growing up, I would never have dreamed of calling my father Mark. Uh, as an adult now, it's, it's not quite as big of a deal. Like, uh, I mean, I still don't necessarily call him Mark, but like, I, he's getting older, he doesn't hear as much. And, and I could be like, hey, dad, hey, dad, Mark. And, and I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be saying in, in a demeaning way. However, I have met 
teenagers who, snarky, I used to be one of them, but they will say like, hey, Mark, like just to try to get their attention. Boys to sons, or um, uh, boys to dad and dads to sons, a lot of times there's that dynamic. Like uh, Connor's never been like, yo, Russ, like ever, because Russ would be like, yo, belt. So, <laughs> um, but it is a little bit more common to, to speak that way. Now, in Judaism and in the Hebrew culture, they go out of their way to make sure that there is a reverence to the name of Elohim. So this is why a lot of times when you hear them speak or you see it written, you will see an article placed with the name Elohim. Or you'll hear them say Elohim plus Haim together so that that way they're kind of merging two words. So there's no chance, no whatever, uh, that they can mess up the name. Um, personally for me, in looking Genesis to Revelation, I don't think that, uh, that God is, is some abusive daddy God who's up there waiting for you to like mispronounce his name. But at the same point in time, there has to be a little bit of respect that's given to just the reverence that they're willing to do for the Lord. Uh, and so this is also done because Elohim is not actually the name. I mean, Elohim is just specifically a title. Elohim uh, predominantly refers to Yahweh, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Israelites, the God of Hebrews. It's also used to refer in the Hebrew text to other gods, to other spiritual beings. Uh, beings. Um, the Bible Project actually has, and I think it's probably, I don't know, maybe 10 years old. They actually have a really good short three-minute animated video talking about uh, a lot of detail on the terminology of Elohim and the context behind it. Um, we're not going to go that far down in tonight, but it is something if you really do have an interest in it, I would recommend going back and looking at in the future. Um, Elohim is the most dominant word used for God or the God of Israel in the Hebrew text. However, it, it's really used the same way that the word theos uh, which is a Greek word, is used in the New Testament. And so when you see theos in the Greek, it's, it's referencing the Elohim of the Hebrew side, and it's, it's about the same context that's there. So let's look, at, uh, let's look at two different thought processes. So there's two different terminologies that are used. One is monotheistic. Some of you might have heard of that. Some of you maybe you haven't. The other is polytheistic. Um, if you listen to... Uh, if you listen to a lot of scholarly individuals, they'll use this terminology on a regular basis. And so I, I want to define that down for you. Monotheistic is relating to or characterized by the belief that there's only one God. Polytheistic is the, the terminology means relating to the characteristics of belief in or worship of more than one God. This is really where we get the argument between like, the Trinity, three persons, one, like it, monotheistic or polytheistic, and they're, they're kind of, they're at odds with each other. So the two terms represent differing thoughts on the Godheads and the role. Elohim is monotheistic in connotation, though its grammatical structuring seems polytheistic. So we started all talking about the fact that like God is very interesting and in how many layers he just puts into one word and, and how many things you could find just by going through that pattern. Well, it's, it's, it's no different than when you're trying to understand the Godhead. Uh, if you look at how it's actually the connotation of it, it should be monotheistic, but the grammatical structuring is polytheistic, both of which are actually differing from each other. So it's like God has a sense of humor in there. Uh, Elohim is also stating that there is one God in the literal meaning, though the grammatical structure seems to indicate that there's more than one God. And this is how you've come up with a thought process of there's one God who manifests himself as three different distinct entities. And this is where you get the Trinity. This is where the age old debate from the last class comes into, well, the Trinity isn't in the Bible. It's at Mark chapter one. Jesus is obviously sitting in the water. And let's, Russ, let's just say you're a bystander here while John the baptizer is, is baptizing him. You can clearly see Yeshua in the water. Like you can see Yeshua in the water the same way I can see Matthew Hartman. Like that, okay, like it triggers, it, re it registers in my brain. And then all of a sudden you hear an audible voice that's not coming from Yeshua, that's coming from the heavenly realm that says, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. 
And you're like, well, that's not Joseph. Um, who is that? And you also see a physical dove descent. So like, they weren't on magic mushrooms. They weren't alive in the 60s. This was, this was not drug-induced. This was something that they had to really wrestle with in, in our finite brain to say, well, wait a second, there's three elements of God being manifested at the same point in time. But obviously, they can't just be three separate gods because how could three get along? And Brent also talked about last, at, at the last class, this isn't a Christian concept. This didn't come around in the Greek thought process. Uh, Judaism and so, certain sects of Judaism have been wrestling with the duality of God, and even some have wrestled with how can three become one? So this isn't necessarily, this didn't come along with Constantine. This didn't come along with, with Rome or with some of those other things. This actually was something that has a lot of origins actually in Judaism. And so just circling back around to that, like this isn't some sort of Christian doctrine we're teaching here. This is doctrine across both sides of the Judeo-Christian thought process. So the grammatical structuring of Elohim seems to indicate that there's more than one God. But the plural ending im is also in other Hebrew words, such as ma'im, which means water. We know ma'im, the, the waters of living water. Um, but you can't really have a plural or a singular water. Water is water. If, if the ocean is in front of me and I say, Russ, ma'im. Well, yes, there's water and there's lots of water all in one place, but there's only one word for both, and that's mine. So again, that in, that ending of Elohim and mine, it says plural, but it also says singular at the same time. So how do you have like a singular water? Like there's not a different terminology for like a singular drop of water that comes from the sky. And, and how do you have plural water? Like, I mean, I don't know, maybe HFF will start bottling plural water from now on, and we'll like call it Hebrew something or whatever, aim. But like, but you can't, like water is just water. It is just what it is, just like Elohim is Elohim. And so God is, one, God is God, one and plural all at the same time. Have I made your head hurt? Because I don't do math. Like literally math is not my thing. And my head hurt while I was writing this. And when I sent it to Brandon, I was like, it's right, but my brain hurts. And he was like, yes. So... <laughs> Remember also from the previous class that the concept of three becoming one, the multiple beings is not a Christian concept, but a Jewish. Sorry, I said that before. See, I got my, I, I'm starting to be able to memorize some notes as I get older. Everything else is falling away from my brain, but I'm jumping ahead in my notes. Um, so it's not a Christian concept. It's a Jewish one. And we can see the complexity of that just in a singular word, which is Elohim, gods, deity, or used as Yahweh the one true God. So think of it this way. God the Father has attributes, just like Russ has attributes, Jacob has attributes, Pharaoh has attributes, Eitan, Maya, all you guys. You guys have all have attributes. Some of them are similar. Some of them are very different. Pharaoh, you have very different attributes than, than Eitan. He is a boy. You are a woman. Just right there, like stark contrast. However, you both have eyes. Praise God. You both have a nose. Like, praise God. You can smell. Um, well, when it's not spring in Oklahoma, you theoretically can smell. So there's attributes. And we see some of those listed out as attributes of God being wisdom, glory, and yet they are described in Proverbs less as like an attribute and more like the terminology of a person. So when we talk about God's glory, we think of that as an attribute. And sometimes it's kind of referenced that way. However, in the book of Proverbs, it's listed more as like God's glory is like a person. Like Alyssa is God's glory, not like, well, this radiance is God's glory. And so again, the Lord goes in and out using language that, that like says one thing, but then also implies another thing. And this is why I say like after 17 years of studying Hebrew and Greek, and I am no scholar. Don't get me wrong. I am not a scholar. I am the farthest thing from a scholar. I am like a Burger King scholar. Like I can, I can get you a burger. That's about all I can get you. The more I know, the more I learn, the more I study, the more I realize I don't have a clue. And honestly, it's almost like this deep, dark rabbit hole. 
And, and I don't want to talk about the sowed and the drash and all those levels because sometimes it's used to, to manipulate and be like, oh, I have some revelation you don't have. But like the further you go into the complexity of just the Hebrew language, just how God does things, the more you realize like, I'm never going to understand this. There's really no way for me to fully grasp this. And then it starts to bring a humility to you to say, well, maybe we are never supposed to. Maybe we were just supposed to walk in submission so that he could get the glory, he could get the honor, and we just strive to just be with him, just to be present. Almost like, like, like a child would be with a parent. Like there's that limited window where your child wants to be with you. And they don't need to know everything about you. They don't need to know. They just enjoy your company. And then comes a day that every parent is the cause of every issue they've ever experienced in their life. And they go that way for a season. And then after that season, they start to realize, you know, my mom was right. Even though I was six foot one and 320 pounds, and I probably would have killed some men on the high school football field. Um, I watched the movie Concussion with Will Smith, and I'm bawling my eyes out in my late 30s saying, I, I despise my mom for this. And my mom was right because I don't have a vegetable for a brain. So you go through those cycles. And so almost like when we're on this earth, the cycle is we're just, we're just to want to crawl into the arms of our God and our creator. Now, this doesn't mean that the attributes of, of wisdom and glory and, and, and all of these other things, that, that they're separate people. This is the argument with Jesus and with all of them. Well, they can't be separate from God. Otherwise, they're different gods. And then you also have the topic of Michael Heiser and the divine council, and they misrepresent his teaching. Well, his teaching is phenomenal, but when it gets misrepresented, when the heblish starts to come in, all of a sudden you have this like Marvel Comics type of like Godhead of like Iron Man one moment takes the thing and that would be the Holy Spirit. Like it's just, it's convoluted and it doesn't exist in scripture. So it doesn't mean that these attributes are separate people. They're just attributes of God. And yet they're also distinct from God in the terminology of Proverbs. So this type of imagery is all throughout the Bible, starting in Genesis 1-1, like we saw uh, when God created it's in the heavens and the earth, and he's working in cooperation with his spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is actually hovering over the waters. And so it's part of God that's hovering over the waters, yet the spirit is distinct and yet not separate. Does that even remotely make sense? Because like I'm saying this to myself for like the seventh time in studying, and like I get it, but like, I don't get it. Like, does that make sense? Like, it's like, I, I get it, but I don't get it. Um, oh, I got ahead of my notes. And the next thing says, does your brain hurt yet? Like, yes, my brain hurts. So <laughs> we also see this in the various names that uh, are used by Yahweh and for Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible. So we see El Shaddai, which means the Lord God Almighty. We see El Elyon the highest God, or some would say the most high God. Um, both, are, both could be pretty much used interchangeably. Adonai, fairly common where a lot of us come from, which means Lord and Master. Yahweh means Lord and Jehovah. Obviously, I, I will just go ahead and address, um, I don't think we would have this. Yes, I understand that the J was not around in Hebrew. Like, I understand that. So we don't need to have an email. Like, why didn't you say Yehovah? Like, I get it. Like Jay came later. If you say Jehovah, that's fine. It is probably more accurate to the original time frame. But we also live in America. This is why Yeshua and then Jesus and how the name came down through the culture. They're, they're one and the same. And so I really just don't get caught up on that. I'd, this whole list right here that I'm going to go through, this is part of why I don't get caught up in the sacred name theology. Because if God was so adamant that you could only call me Yahweh or Yehovah or Yeshua or Yehoshua, which is probably, Joshua is probably the most accurate from what we have. Um, if he was so adamant about that, and, and, and like if Matt was so adamant that you only call me Matthew, if you call me Matt, I, I'm going to karate chop you. And by the way, I want a belt this weekend so I can karate chop your head in half. Like I'm going to step back and say, okay, he's dead serious about this. I'm going to really, really try hard not to screw up and call him Matt. Well, Matt and Matthew are very similar, let alone if I walked up and said, well, you look like a, like a Herman, so I'm going to call you a Herman from now on. And he's like, you're just disrespectful. 
And so Yahweh comes in and he already gives all these different names or titles for himself throughout the Bible. He does the same thing with the feast days and the feast days are the next class. And so he already makes provision to not have Passover on a specific day, even though there's a commandment to have Passover on a specific day. And so if, if, if it was down to you are going to hell, you have transgressed the word of God, you, I'm turning you over to the devil because you did Passover on the 15th of April, not the 14th of April. Um, I just don't see that. If you, you're not going to hell because you use Adonai or Lord or God or Hashem or all these things versus Yahweh. He automatically has already made provisions before we were ever born. I just don't feel like he thinks it's as big of a deal. I think it's a big deal if you were, you were to speak disparagingly of El Shaddai, speak disparagingly of Adonai. If you were to use the titles of the names of the Lord in a disparaging way, I think you would have an issue. But to use them at different points in time to speak, I think is actually more biblically accurate because they have specific meanings. So Yehovah, Jehovah, Nisi, the Lord is my banner. That's kind of a cool one. I haven't heard that a lot. Um, but Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Ra, the Lord is my shepherd. Then you have Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. You know, in, in this allergy season, we might not, we might want to direct our prayers to, to that, that person. Because like the sinus cavities are all dry and everybody's dry. And like, like and then you're not dry because you have the snot. Like we need the Lord that heals in the, in the spring slash second winter slash fourth spring, which is basically February through about May, right around in there. Uh, Jehovah Shema, I can't even talk today because my mouth is so dry. Shema, Shema, and I have it written out. I told you I'm not a scholar. The Lord is there. I, again, I practiced all of these. This is the way as we go through the taboo series that the Lord keeps me humble. He's like, you, you can't speak English and you definitely can't speak Hebrew. So Jehovah said, Kenu, the Lord, our righteousness. I'm really going to try hard on this. So we, we need to pray for some extra grace. Jehovah Mech Odish Kem, the Lord who sanctifies you. El Olam, the everlasting God. Elohim. God, deities, Juana, jealous, talked about, not the Hebrew word, but we talked about that towards the end of the sermon this past week. Um, I think I already said Jehovah Jireh. Uh, no, I did not. Ooh, ooh, I saved it towards the end. Like that's, that's like one of my favorite songs. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. And Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. Um, it could also be used as like Adonai, Ziva, Ot. Um, there's just different ways, different pronunciations and how those things go. Um, these are not separate gods. It's not like Yahweh has all of these people over for dinner and they're all separate people. Like, no, they were all distinct, a part of Yahweh, the, the Hebrew God, Elohim, yet they're distinct attributes and distinct ways of how Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, manifests and reveals himself. It's important to kind of understand some of those things as a new, or excuse me, as an Old Testament Torah concept, because over the next couple of months, when we start looking at what the Bible says about the gifts, offices, and fruit of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, we need to understand that this isn't just, this just isn't a New Testament concept. This isn't foreign. This isn't like the Holy Spirit took it upon itself to have offices and attributes um, it actually comes directly from the original creator of all things, which is Yahweh, the God, the father. He's the one who creates all things and through him are all things. So it's, it's delegated from him to Yeshua and to the Holy spirit, which uh, Paul references as the spirit of Christ. Uh, these different titles, functions, and attributes immediately dispel the sacred name movement and their theology. God spells himself out multiple times throughout multiple places in the scripture with these distinct roles, manifestations, and titles. Uh, the power comes from the character and the nature of Yahweh. It doesn't come in the character and the nature of Jehovah Jireh being some separate entity. There is absolutely no power in heaven and earth that didn't come through Yahweh. 
So God the Father has is the source of power. He delegates that as he sees fit in these different manifestations. Uh, remember, even, even Satan needed God the Father's permission. Satan, to test Job, had to go into the throne room and ask for Yahweh's permission to test his servant Job. And then Yahweh sets the battlefield. He says, you can do all these things, but you can't kill him. So if Satan, a lot of times we, we talk about Satan, the adversary to Yahweh, the adversary to Jesus. We talk to, uh, about some all-powerful, all-knowing being. Satan himself is in submission to God. So the greatest adversary of God the Father, Hasatan, if Hasatan needs permission, then even to a certain level, Hasatan understands that he is a created being with limitation. So let's look at God the Father of Abraham. In Genesis 17, 1 through 8, it says, When Abram was 90, this is before he was changed the name from Abram to Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenants between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father, excuse me, of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your son, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And when I establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offsprings after you, and I will give to you and to your offsprings after you a land of sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God will be the God of this multitude of nations that is going to come from Abraham. I also, this is a complete side note because we'll never actually do a class on this because it doesn't warrant it. But I have heard and theologies have been made and doctrines have been made in the, the Messianic Hebrew root side of Christianity that this is a passage in Genesis 17 that justifies them. Russ, sorry, you're the easiest to see because you're between the light bulbs, but you're Russ. Your parents called you Russ. And then all of a sudden you get radically saved. You understand the Hebrew side. And you said, well, God gave me a new name. I'm now Eliyahu Ben David the 13th. Um, if God gave you that name, if he truly came to you in a vision, in a dream and said, Russ, I am, I've got this calling on your life and this is the name I will give you. Um, I'm not going to stand in the way of that. I'm not going to say you're crazy to your face. I might pray to God about it, but for a confirmation, but, but this is used a lot of times where people would just randomly change their name to Hebrew names. It's like, well, I was born Kathy and now I need to be Jemiah or Root or, or some of these uh, Hadassah. And it's like, guys, this is not what God is trying to say here. God is trying to change the trajectory of nations, the lineage. This is why even in the 28 days that's coming up next week, where we do the prayer and the fasting and all those things that we do leading into the spring feast, we're going to be going through the book of Matthew. And Ian was talking to me on Saturday right after service because he's doing the first one. And he's like, man, I kind of was bummed out that I, I, I got Matthew chapter one because it's literally just a bunch of genealogies. But then he was like, by the time I started studying through to put my notes together, how encouraging is it like to read through the genealogies? Because it, people, how do people dispel you? If you've been in the Messianic Hebrew root side of the like, well, you're not Jewish. Like you're not Jewish. Well, you, your mom's not Jewish, so you can't make Aliyah to Israel. And like they, they find ways to take issue with your bloodline or your family tree or whatever. This is setting up, and I know we're looking at God the Father right now, but this is setting up the very interactions with the Pharisees and the Sadducees where they're saying our father is Abraham and Yeshua is saying, God in the flesh is saying your father is the devil and he's countering the Torah teaching, the yoke of the Torah teachers, the life that the Torah should be giving. He's taking issue with that and he's setting up then for Paul to come back in the future and talk about how all parties, the Martin Luther King's speech, I have a dream, all parties in Christ 
can become a part of the same family. Through adoption, they can become sons and daughters of the same family. Doesn't matter whether you were born a Jew. Doesn't matter whether you were born rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you were born a slave or you were the owner of slaves. It doesn't matter whether you were a male or female. In Messiah, fast forwarding, this is starting that plan. Everything in the Bible is a part of that plan. They're not separated from that plan. Starting to lay out the thought that your heritage, your family name, you know, St. Patty's Day was on, on Sunday. It is like the once a year where all the Irish come out of the woodwork. We already knew you were Irish. Like we already got it like O'Malley. Like, like we didn't know. Like you're redheaded. We didn't know. Nobody had a clue. But it's like the heritage day. Well, in Christ, we all have a heritage. It doesn't matter where you come from. Why? Because Paul says, if you're a Messiah, you're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. What promise? This very promise. Yahweh makes a promise with Abram, changes his name, changes his genealogy, changes the trajectory of all nations moving forward, ultimately for the king of all nations to come, make an atoning sacrifice and start the process back. How beautiful is that? Like Abraham had no idea, none. Even I think in the vision where he tells him to go outside during the day and look at the stars, I think it was probably a Moses moment. You know, Moses didn't get to enter the promised land, but God took him up on the, on the mountain. And I think he probably showed him. You know, like when you're watching those movies and, and they kind of show like a, a, a futuristic vision of what this might be. I personally like to think pure opinion. There's nothing in the scripture that says this, that God took up on the mountain and was like, thank you. I know, I know you had this screw up, but I want to show you what I'm going to do through your obedience. Not, not just the one time he made a mistake. Well, honestly, I think that was probably the same moment with the stars. When God says, come out here and look at the stars, it's daytime. And some will say, well, he was looking at the sun and that was a signet of Jesus, maybe. But I almost feel like that aha moment was, I told you I'm going to make you the father of multitudes of nations. And it kind of just passed by while Yahweh was with Abraham and he got to see it. Again, I can't prove that. Makes for a really good movie. Maybe the chosen dude, Dallas, whatever his name is, might do it in the future. But, but like, I believe God, God interacts that way as a father when you want him to, when you close it off, I feel like he also acts like a father, like, okay, go do your own thing. I'll be, I'll be here to get you when you, when you run out of gas or you, you get a flat tire or, you know, you do something stupid. Uh, son, you put your head in the banister and now you can't get your head out. Like, I believe God will be there as the father in that moment, but he also affords those opportunities. Isaiah 63, 16 through 17. You are our father, Though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from old is your name. God says that he wants to make a covenant with Abraham and multiply the world to radically change everything. And to just think about birth for a second. Like, how do you multiply? How do you multiply? You need a seed to multiply. You must have a seed that gets to an egg and multiplies and creates life. This is also the same parable we see of the seeds where seeds will fall on fertile soil. They'll immediately produce fruit. We love those. Like, oh yes, like they're immediately producing the fruit we want to see. It also says that there's seeds that will fall on soil and may not produce a plant or fruit for, for some time to come. Those are a little bit harder for us to, to be patient with sometimes. And then it also says there's a third type of seed scenario where the seed falls in thorns and thickets and it doesn't produce it all. It doesn't multiply. So the father actually provides the seeds of the multiplication for everything. Everything is through him. Yahweh. God is the father of Israel. In Exodus 4, 22, 23, we're getting ready to come up on that time. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. That's, that's a duel. 
He's like basically saying, hey, hey, let him go. Let him go. Let my firstborn son go. And if you don't let my firstborn son go, I'm coming and taking yours. Like he's dead serious. Trade for trade, one for the other. Take the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people were God's firstborn son. And he was willing to take out Pharaoh's firstborn son just to prove the severity of his desire to protect his kids. Think about that. You know, a lot of times we think of God as a, as a judge. And there are times in the Bible he speaks on that. But he loved his firstborn son, Israel, so much that he was willing to protect them by offering to remove their firstborn son if they didn't oblige him. Um, we relate to God as a father that through Jesus, God's son, we can share in that sonship through adoption, through the atoning work of the cross. And then God, natural progression, God, the father of all. God is the father to Abraham and Abraham is the father to many nations. We saw that in Genesis. We also see this reference in Apostles Paul's writing to the Galatians, just as Abraham believed in God and was counted to him as righteousness. One of these days we'll get into a series on righteousness, which is talking about giving and living a giving lifestyle to others, Zedekah, all the other things, because ultimately everything we have is God giving. God's giving you. God gave you breath today. God gave you gas in your car. God gave you health. God gave you uh, the food you ate, the, the water you drank. God gave you the movie you watched. God gave you the job you had. Everything that we have is God practicing his righteousness to the creation he created. And so he expects us to do the same thing, to be good stewards in his image to the creation. Galatians 3, 6 through 9, know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham and the scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Guys, this is, this is a hard one for some of us to understand and to take in. Foreseen that God would justify not not save. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about justification. The justification of the Gentiles was by faith. Same way as Abraham. Dr. David Jones has a great teaching from back in the day that the gospel according to Abraham, and it goes through how faith is not a New Testament concept. Faith is not some sort of, of gospel of John on. This is something that was instilled with Abraham and in Hebrews chapter 11, ties it all together. Moses, Enoch, all of them, they will not find the reward, the accommodation for their faith apart from the same way we will. Well, Galatians 3 is basically saying the same thing for the Gentiles. There is no other door for the Gentiles. One of the old memes, I haven't seen it in a long time, but uh, um, and God, I haven't seen it for a long time, but it used to say, there is no gate in Jerusalem for Gentiles. And it's like, duh, duh. Like, are we still having that conversation? Like, they're not Gentiles anymore. They've been adopted in the family. And if the Gentiles can't be adopted in the family, then most of the people who attend this in church are in trouble because most of them in this church aren't, don't have Jewish bloodline. And the whole concept on that type of teaching, that whole two house, whatever you want to call it, is that ultimately the Gentiles, there's no gate. So they have to be grafted into Israel. So then this random Gentile now becomes from the tribe of Dan. Like, what if he didn't want to be from the tribe of Dan? Does he get to like not be drafted? Does he get to pull a Eli Manning and say like, well, I'm really glad that Nephtali drafted me and grafted me into their tribe, but I really would rather be a part of Judah. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. Like, this is our human brain trying to, like, wrap things into how we do, whereas God just says, hey, guess what? You're my son and you're my daughter. Like, welcome home. It's not like, oh, in the heavenly realm, and this is why Hebrews is important too, the Levitical priesthood does not have a role in the heavenlies. The Levitical priesthood doesn't get to go into the throne room and take over for the elders and the beasts. 
the Levitical priesthood and the lineage of the tribalism that's here was specifically meant for this earth. And so I hear people say like, well, I'm from the tribe of Levi. And it's like, you don't have a clue. Just because you buy Levi Strauss does not mean you're from Levi. Does that mean I'm from the tribe of Dickies? Like, no, this is ridiculous. Like, but these things are talked about and they're shared and there's, there's ministries who've built large teachings off these things. Like, this is talking about being sons and daughters. Why? Because God is a father. So, gen, the, could, so that jo, God could justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I've also heard that because God blessed Abraham and we're from the nations, we're from the lineage of Abraham, that we're automatically blessed because of Abraham. That's not what this means. We find our accommodation the same way Abraham does. This doesn't mean that you get to punch a ticket because somehow I might be righteous or I might be a seed of Abraham from the actual bloodline. Again, that's not how this works. The middle wall of partition, all these things all torn down so that we have the ability to go directly to the Father. I'm still not sure how Catholicism works. Are they reading the New Testament? They don't have to go into the, say the Hail Marys and the Rosary to the dude behind the veil. Like if we started trying to do that in this room back there, y'all be like, no, thank you. Bye, Chris. Peace out. Like Bible says I can go directly to the father and talk to the father. Maybe that's a mission field for you is Catholicism. I, I don't know. Like a lot of good people met a lot of good people. Joe Biden, not a Catholic. Just not. I don't care what he says not but there's a lot of good catholics hebrews chapter 11 39 through 40 and all these though commended through their faith did not receive what was promised since god had provided something better for us that apart from us they should not be made perfect we cannot be made perfect any way different than they were made perfect and that is through christ how does christ get his power all power was created by god the father yahweh so, so Christ can't do, and I, I mean, again, there's a hundred verses. I try to stay away from like the, the normative ones where it's like, I, I and my father are one, like the ones that everybody debates a hundred times over, because it's like, it's true. Jesus did not come here to do anything opposite than what his father had already done previously to him. There was no new gospel. There was no new plan. This was the entirety of the plan that was put in place from Genesis 1.1. Jesus didn't get some new role. It was already something that God had planned. This is what's going to have to happen. And why Abraham is so important is because it helps you understand that this is not a New Testament concept. Because if it's solely a New Testament concept, then it would at least imply that Yahweh, God the Father, Elohim, changed his mind, had some other promise, gave certain statements to certain people and statements to the other. This is why the New Testament and the conversation about Abraham is so important. Because I personally believe that, that Yeshua was the one who physically walked through the covenant of the pieces with Abraham. When it says that Abraham was put to sleep and that he walked through the pieces, I believe that was Yeshua. At the burning bush, I believe that was Yeshua. I don't believe any naked eye on this realm has seen God the Father except for God the Son who can only reflect God the Father. And this is a weird concept because almost all of our culture today wants boys. Boys want to be separate from their dads for a period of time. Landon isn't setting out to look exactly like you, Matt. Talk exactly like you. Like, no, he's... He's becoming a teenager. He wants to find his own things. And sometimes there's similarities. Like, yeah, you guys like to like play rock band together. Like, that's totally fun. You like to kick people's butts with karate. Totally fun. Like, there's certain things you have in common. But he doesn't wake up in the morning and say, how do I, how do I change my eyebrows to be a little bit darker, or a little bit lighter? Or, mom, um, how do you dye my eyes so that I have the same color eyes as dad? Or, hey, I need my hair. Like, He's not walking around trying to be the exact replication of, of his father on this earth. 
There's certain similarities, but there's certain differences. Yeshua was the exact replica of his father on this earth. I and my father are one. We do the same thing. I didn't come to preach a different gospel. I didn't come to replace Abraham. I didn't come to replace Moses. I didn't come to replace David. I came to fill them up. To give them the true meaning, to give them the true power, to give them the true authority. Even the prophets who were given the authority in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Persia and the exile to Babylon and all these times at Israel, 70% of Israel's kings were bad and they ended up in captivity. Even they had power. When, when the prophets spoke, there were people who were scared. They were like, okay, we need, we need to make an adjustment. We need to like turn around and do something different. But yet it says, when Yeshua was reading from the scroll of Isaiah, there was a different authority. Why? Because who do you think gave the prophecy to Isaiah? This is, like, this is like, okay, I like Nirvana, and Kurt Cobain did a really good job singing this song, but all of a sudden, 10 years down the road, I get to hear from the writer who wrote it. Oh, man, I, here's what I was going through. How cool is that? Like, you, you get to hear the intimacy of the author. When Yeshua speaks, he was the intimacy of the author. But he didn't walk around and say, like, don't call Steve Austin. I'm here. He wasn't chugging a beer and smashing a can on his forehand and throwing it off and stuff. He was just, he was humble and meek and just let his light shine. And they knew it was different. This is why we put such an emphasis on this at HFF. You can walk around and tell me you're Torah observant, uh, which I don't think is absolute. It's impossible for you to be Torah observant. It just is impossible. You can be Torah pursuant. You can be Torah passionate. We can split hairs. But there's nobody in here flying back to Jerusalem three times a year. There's nobody in here bringing offerings to the temple uh, altar that doesn't exist. There's nobody in here doing, nobody's dropping trial at the door and checking for circumcision. And if we start, run. Yeah, run. Like literally, like that, that's, that's inappropriate. It's cultish. It's not okay. But, but I know of places that do that. And people go. Why? You're already a son and daughter through Christ. We don't have to get weird. It's weird. Whoa. It's going to take me a while to get over that. Mm. These different attributes and functions of, of God, the Father, aren't some different set of metrics or pathways that you can get to him. These are attributes that also can be attributed to separate individual personalities or distinctions of him, but they're not separate people. And these different attributes and functions all come with one original power source. And that's God, the father, that's the creator. And then he delegated those distinct natures, power and persons from himself. This is why we have the issue with Satan, the adversary. It's not that he shouldn't have the power. He was given the power by Yahweh, God, the father. He was a son. He was given the power. At some point in time, that son said, ah, I can do it. I don't need you. This power is mine. It's not yours anymore, dad. And then he tried to lead a revolt of other sons and daughters to say, come follow me. Man, did they bet wrong. They didn't cover the spread. Not only did they not cover the spread, they put their whole life savings in on the, on the counterfeit. And they spend all this time in torment and trying to torment other souls while the angels who knew the power and who the power source was sit down every day and fall in submission and say, holy, 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 worthy, worthy, kadosh, kadosh, laka, kadosh, over and over again, because they know the power source. 
They know the majesty. They know the authority. There's no question in their mind. So if the angels who are also created beings, if they also understand the power and the majesty and the might that comes from the Father and is delegated to the Son, why do we as human beings, the most fickle and and finite of all creation, sit down here and try to argue about what he can and cannot do? Just because we're like, oh, well, we're, we're advanced species. Wait till we find out that evolution was actually semi-true and we came from monkeys. I don't think it's true. I'm just joking. But like, that's a question. Human beings are questioning whether we came from monkeys and we're trying to say what Yahweh can and cannot do. What? The people who are being compared to the ones who like pick stuff out of their hair and eat it. <laughs> like, Really? I, I, I don't mean to have a mocking term. I just, the rational side of my brain says, we have human beings who we consider to be some of the smartest intellectual individuals in our world, scientists, biologists, whatever. And they're questioning whether we came from the gorilla glue guy. There's a real conversation about this. And we're arguing over, with the greatest power of heaven and earth. I have some words that I can't say out loud, which according to the Sermon on the Mount, I've already done and sinned, but like, hogwash. Nobody did answer me on whether that's a curse word in homeschooling or not. So I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep riding with that one just to make sure that, but like, it, it blows, blows my mind that somehow our, our, our westernized culture even after the cross, thinks that somehow we have the right to tell God who, what, why, how, and when. I hope we will find forgiveness and mercy at the hands of our Father. Because for him to love us as much as he does and put up with the nonsense that he does while we still start to argue over what he can and cannot do, it's heartbreaking. I know how heartbreaking it is when, when I get into an argument with my sons or my daughters and, and it's like, I literally told you to take the trash out when you turn two. You're 17. You're not 17. You're 15. You're, no, I don't need to tell you every day. No, I don't. You know, well, I just figured maybe like today was like a day you didn't think I needed to do that. Like we're going on like 3,032 days now of it was your responsibility. I just woke up today and it didn't. I mean, this is how we approach God sometimes. And this is how we approach the word of God. I know who you are. I've seen you reveal yourself. Your word reveals yourself. But today I'm just going to say something different because I can. Because some random ministry who has no no congregation, no accountability says that this Hebrew word means this, or in 1972, this prophecy was this, and yet there's the shred of evidence to back it up. And we just change our thoughts and interaction with God the Father. God is not schizophrenic. We are. And he's a loving father who hasn't put us in a mental hospital yet with padded walls and sedated us to where we can't function. He still loves us. We have a perfect father who delegates, nurtures, and loves in perfection. Guys, if you're struggling in your relationship with your wife or wives with your, with your husbands or your children, study the perfection of God's love and just try to get 1% better. Just 1% better. When I started to really put a focus on God's love and what he says about his love, I just shifted how I interacted with people in regards to the Torah and everything else. Because if God isn't going to be as as haughty, if God's not going to be as vicious or as crude to the mistakes of an individual or the stumbling or the lack of understanding of somebody, who do I think I am? Nikki, if the Bible says you're my sister and I'm your brother and God's our father, I don't get to discipline you. I literally have this conversation with my five kids all the time. It's like, mom and dad are trying to discipline them right now. We're here. We're doing this. Why are you talking? 
the funniest part is when the seven-year-old's trying to correct the 15-year-old. And it's like, you haven't brushed your teeth in three years. So I, like when you put it into perspective as God as a father, and we're trying to understand his commandments and his instructions for our life and for your life or whatever, when I start to walk over and say, hey, sister, uh, notice that you suck at life. You really need to fix this. She's like, yeah, I also see like the glaring holes in all the areas of your life, but I've chosen to just love you anyways because our dad loves you and we're just trying to walk for the betterment of each other and be supportive. That's the appropriate response. This would not be. We have to remember that the father is the father. The mother is the mother. We'll go in at some point in time because there's a whole... God not only talks about himself as a father, but he talks himself as a mother. You want to have a paradigm shift. Start trying to think of the most macho masculine man who's perfect as a warrior and then perfect as, as this lover and father to all these people. And then flip the script and say, well, let's not talk about him as male. Let's talk about him as female. But it's all throughout the scripture. God is a mother. I can't wait to go through that. I don't know when God will tell us to do it. I probably should study it more. I'm just studying it as a hobby, but like, that's the duality of the natures inside God is that God can be the perfect father and God can also be the perfect mother. I can't even figure out how to be the perfect father. And I'm trying to tell the perfect father and the perfect mother how to be the perfect father. Like think of how, how backwards that is. And so the perfection of our God, Yahweh Elohim, who delegates, he is not only that, he is it, but then he delegates in perfection he nurtures imperfection and loves imperfection to all these different entities and attributes at the same time. Mind blown. So if you, if you struggle with, with that understanding of anything tonight as God as a father or whatever comes up there, I do really want to encourage you to go back to our YouTube um, channel and watch the Orphan Spirit series. It doesn't necessarily go into the nitty gritty of the specifics like we talked about tonight about specific roles and manifestations of God, but one of the greatest epidemics of the current church in the current world is orphans. Even in the Christian church, a lot of people love God, but, but they absolutely do not how, know how to accept God as the perfect father because most people didn't have the perfect father. Some did, but most didn't. And so when you start to look at, at the orphan spirit series and you start to look at these natures of how God interacts as a loving father, it, it really starts to shatter the projection of I had an earthly father with issues. And so I'm looking at my heavenly father through the same lens as my earthly father. And even for me and my wife, and we had good parents, like it was revolutionary for us to see these attributes of the Lord and say like, okay, maybe we can open ourselves up and be transparent with God in these areas because he will nurture and heal us. God is a father. Jesus is the son and the Holy Spirit is the helper to understand and give wisdom of all things. And so when I talk about being a Trinitarian and people are like, oh, you can't be a Trinitarian. There are very distinct natures of one part of God that are specifically meant to interact with creation in a way throughout the Bible. Yes, there's seven spirits of God and there's other manifestations, but these three distinct portions are interacting and interwoven into the entire narrative without it ever actually saying the word Trinity in the Bible. And so when we go back and we read Torah portions, when we go back and we read historical context, when we go back and start to go through the spring feast, don't go back thinking and looking at God the same way as the father. Maybe just maybe this year, think of it through the lens of if you had a bad father, if you had a bad childhood, what would have, been, would have been like if I actually had a good dad? If he actually loved me, if he actually hadn't done whatever those things were, if he actually had spoken life over me, what would that have been like? And go and look at the stories of the Bible through that lens. Because I promise you, when you start looking through the Bible, even if you can't accept it, I get it. Like if you had trauma from your, your earthly father, I get it. It's hard to accept it. Just go see if it's there in the scripture. Be open to the concept that might be present. You don't even have to accept it right now. 
The Holy Spirit will do the healing work. I can't. But go through and read the Exodus story as a dad who has kids who are in captive. Who's that dude, Ian? Uh, that dude who does all those movies where like his daughter's kidnapped and like he like goes to other countries. Liam Neeson. Like he's literally always like, I don't know who you are, but I'm gonna hunt you down. I'm gonna find you. I'm gonna kill you. I got skills. Like, think of think of Yahweh as as somebody who didn't even make that phone call. He was kind and compassionate to the person who was causing harm to his kids. Just if you have trauma in that area, go back and read it with an open mind, looking to see if there's other kind attributes of God there. Because once you start to see God as a loving and nurturing father, oh my gosh. The secret weight I had for 17 years of worrying about transgressing the commandments. And again, I'm not giving you a pass to transgress the commandments in any way, shape, or form. Because the Bible doesn't give you a pass to do so. But the weight of like, if I misstep here, I'm going to be in trouble. And then all of a sudden, when I started to see God as a loving father, I was like, he's not going to put me in timeout. He's not going to spank me. He's going to love me. He's going to teach me. He's going to show me. He's going to put me back up on the bike and teach me how to ride with training wheels. He's going to put me back up on the bike, so on and so on. And so it just was revolutionary for me and my wife. And so if any of you come from those areas or have those struggles, maybe it'd be revolutionary for you as well in this season. So, Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word, to have some fellowship time with you again, Lord. We lift up all those who are ill and even those who, who went back down again with illness today, Lord. And uh, we ask that you would be with Brent and Tanya right now as they're leading a Passover Seder for a group. And we just ask, Lord, that wherever your people are gathered, that you would manifest your power and your presence with them. And so we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen.